What I want to do today, I first thought about, um, I want to have the chance myself to talk to some people about my new test, the cellar, just because I want the feedback and the time to get my own thoughts about it. Um, when I've said what's new about the fella, I'm sort of assuming that you know what I mean by new. Um, are most of you familiar with the spatter? Yes. Yeah. Okay, so what new is by reference to the spatter and my other test that I produced a while ago, the C part, which you'll see is largely included in the fella. Um, I want to talk about what's in and what's out. I had originally thought I was just going to show you the fella, but being me, I cannot avoid getting theoretical. I'm sorry about that. Um, so I want to try to explain why things are in and why things are out. Partly because as I'm getting older, I'm suddenly realizing I don't really understand phonological awareness. <laughs> The more you think about it, the more complicated it gets. And I've got some ideas that are fairly new for me about what I'm assessing, and they all get raised as I think about what's in and what's not in the fella. So if you'll bear with me while we do a little bit of theory first, then I'll show you the test and you can see what it is. Okay? Please feel free to make this as interactive as you want and stop me at any stage if you'd like to stop and ask a question, or and do remind me to stop at the halfway point. Um, some background to the fella, F-E-L-A stands for Foundations of Early Literacy Assessment. Um, I designed it with the Northern Territory Department of Education, thank you to them. Um, the background to that collaboration is I was contacted by a couple of groups who were either providing intervention or assessing intervention in remote indigenous communities in the Northern Territory. And I had a phone call originally from someone from the University of Western Australia who was running one of the evaluation teams saying, is the SPATAR suitable for use in remote indigenous communities? I said, no, it's fine. <laughs> and they said, well, what is? And I said, I have no, I don't, no idea. I don't think anything is. And they were very kind enough to invite me to come along with them. You know, very difficult to get permission to go into the remote mm -hmm. communities, to work with them um, in school and in community to try to work out what they might use as their, one of their measures was going to be phonemic awareness. And so we just just sort of got into that. Um, that evolved several years later. I developed something that itself turned into the SEPA, but that evolved into um, collaboration with the Northern Territory Department of Education who wanted to roll out a phonemic awareness, te awareness test across all Northern Territory schools, including remote indigenous communities, which was a big ask. But they were patient with me and we developed this CPAR together with much, much effort. My aim in doing this was to provide something as simple as I could make it, aiming to check that the students, mainstream but especially remote indigenous communities and indigenous communities that were urban too, they were very big communities, have the basic prerequisites to good phonics teaching. I think um, many people take it for granted that you've got to get systematic phonics teaching into disadvantaged schools. There are some people who don't believe that, but that is where the general research is going. And I work from the assumption, okay, if they're going to get systematic phonics, is, are there any prerequisites they need before they're ready for the phonics programs? phonemic awareness cropped up as the obvious mm. candidate for that. Um, I had to keep it as simple as possible. I very badly wanted to make it a test that could be taught to and taught from. So nothing was tested that wasn't relevant to what they actually needed to learn to do. So even if something is a good predictor, it, like rapid naming, might not be particularly useful to teach rapid naming itself an indication but not a target. So try to limit things to targets. Um, 
I wanted it to be as useful as possible. The remote indigenous students are being thrown into a school system. There are very few bilingual schools around um, where they teach early literacy in first language. Mostly the need is for um, kids who are thrown into an English medium school where they're expected to learn their literacy in English no matter how good their English is to start off with. And very possibly the test administrators who um, often in remote communities are the teaching assistants who are themselves indigenous. indigenous. Um, I wanted to make it as useful as possible for all of them. And I did want to keep the expectations high. Um, communities are sick of someone blowing in with a test and give it to the students and prove like in that line that they all do badly. That's not the point. They don't want to be told that. They didn't want a normed test. They wanted a test that could show them what was there, what wasn't there, and what needed to be done. And very important not to dumb it down. There's no reason not to expect normal language learners, even if they have a hearing loss, uh, and, um, and most of the indigenous mm. kids do have a hearing loss, there's no reason not to expect them to be able to learn. You just have to adjust your teaching. You shouldn't need to dumb things down. Mm. Um, and hopefully to make it applicable to mainstream students as, a, um, as well. As I go through the fella, um, I'll try to point out how I try to do each of these things. What I'm... No, hang on, I'll just go back again. Um, what I'm planning to do today is do my bit of theory and then we'll stop for a break and another glass of wine and then I'll actually go through the fella and try to relate my, the theory that I've gone through to what I actually put into the fella. Okay? Remember I said phonemic awareness stands out as an obvious prerequisite that kids have to develop adequately before they can respond to a good phonics program. Um, it's perfectly well accepted that phonemic awareness, not early phonological awareness, but phonemic awareness of phonemes and literacy develop interactively. Um, learning, being exposed to formal literacy instruction improves phonemic awareness and vice versa. They're not simply the one causes the other. And if you have a reciprocal, not a simple one-way causal relationship, You've got to be pretty careful what you mean by prerequisites, don't you? Mm -hmm. And this got me really scratching my head and thinking about what I mean by phonemic awareness. And I think, you know, this is the end of the story. I'll tell you the end and then I'll tell you the middle. I think I've come to realize that you can't simply describe phonemic awareness as being under the umbrella of phono phonological awareness. Uh, you know, phonemic Awareness 101 says phonological awareness is awareness of sounds in the speech stream and phonemic awareness is one subset. I, it just depends on the size of the sound that you listen to. That's the assumption that I've held and used for many years and I'm suddenly starting to think that that isn't good enough. Mm -hmm. <laughs> Do I have all the answers? No, but let's talk about that. <laughs> so if you don't mind sort of, um, sort of following me as I try to explain why I, why I think that, I'll appreciate your comments, okay? Okay, phonological awareness, what is it? No news to you, the ability to focus on the sound of the speech stream as opposed to attending to the meaning of what's said. So it's a descent centering from meaning and focusing on sound, which will, if you can do that, you'll understand the question, what's the sound at the beginning of cat? Can't be answered with meow, it's got to be answered with something approximating a cook sound. You're not talking about what it means, you're talking about how it sounds. That's a big cognitive leap. You two-year-olds can't do it, and you're lucky if a three-year-old can. It's a big thing for for, for a, um, it's a big developmental stage, the readiness to decenter from meaning and focus on sound. It's natural mm -hmm. to focus on meaning. 
There is, however, I'm very convinced, and you'll see how I've tackled it in the filler, a continuum. You can be able to decenter sort of implicitly and just play around with the sounds of speech, like take me to your leader kind of playing, or you can be explicit about what you're doing, which I think of as a metaphonological skill. By meta, you're thinking about the phonology, you're thinking about it. It's a conscious thought process. Now I will analyze the sound structure rather than just responding to it in, a, in an implicit way. Um, I didn't use the word sounds of the speech stream. I'm not talking about phonemes yet. Sounds to get you into phonemes. Just the sound of the speech stream. My hypothesis is, and I think it stands to reason, that the more explicit your understanding is that, okay, we're going to analyze sounds now, I know what you mean by sounds, the more metaphonological you are, the better for you at school entry. You're less likely to have kids bewildered. That's my hypothesis, I think it would be difficult to prove me wrong on that one. Okay, so phonemic awareness is, of course, the ability to focus on phonemes. And I think with phonemic awareness, there is a very similar implicit to explicit continuum going on, and this is where the complications come in. Um, when we're talking about the fella, I'll show you in the first sound ID test what I mean by implicit awareness of phonemes versus explicit awareness of phonemes. Just want to say now, phonemic awareness always develops in the context of learning about letter-sound relationships. That's how it happens. Mm -hmm. If you're not in that context, as is the case with... There's lots of research that has focused on, for example, Portuguese people who've lived in rural communities with no schooling available, so they are not literate at all. They tend to be able to do phonological awareness tasks like syllables and rhyme, and some of them have oral rhyming histories and things like that, they tend not to be able to break words into phonemes. As soon as they're exposed to an alphabetic script, they get it. Phonemic awareness doesn't develop all on its own. It develops when you're exposed to an alphabetic script. The same has been confirmed with Chinese literate people who don't know the Chinese alphabetic script pinyin their phonemic awareness is very, very weak until they're taught an alphabetic script. That's how it happens. And this means that explicit phonemic awareness, knowing about exactly what you mean by a phony, is intimately involved with letter knowledge. That's how it happens. In fact, Brian Byrne and Ruth Fielding Barnsley, years ago in the 1980s and 90s, did research with uh, pre-literate children, showing that the aha moment, the milestone, as they start to be able to understand and generalize any kind of phonics teaching, happens when they can both identify a phoneme and give it a name. They can say, ah, uh, that word, mo, starts with the same sound as mum, and that's the m sound. Um, and the actual letter comes along with that too. Uh, they're very, very closely related. That's not difficult to handle, and, but I've been recently been thrown a little further into the deep end with the concept of advanced phonemic awareness. Um, Learning Difficulties Australia and the DDOL network have been talking at great length. Do many of you know what I mean by the DDOL network? Mm -hmm. It's a discussion group of people who really want phonics to be <laughs> taught properly, <laughs> um, amongst other things. <laughs> so they've asked a uh, New York researcher, David Kilpatrick, to come out to Australia. He's doing an Australian tour in August. He'll be here here in Melbourne doing a tour that Alison can, Alison's organising for learning difficulties. Mm -hmm. He has thrown the cat amongst the pigeons and um, saying that it's really important not to forget about what he calls advanced phonemic awareness. 
not just the basic segmenting and blending, but something more advanced, by which he means the ability to do complex phony manipulation tasks quickly. Now, it's well established that complex phony manipulation tasks, as in the spatter, the deletion of consonants from clusters, are the <coughs> ones that correlate best with literacy development, mm -hmm. along with non-word reading. Uh, kids reach ceiling on the simple tasks fairly early, but you still get very strong correlations with ability to do the complex tasks. I'm sure those of you who've used the spatter will be aware that many kids do fine on the early things, but still have reading and, reading and spelling problems, and you'll be able to pick them out only on the very last two subtests and non-word reading. Um, there's a problem, and that is that assessment of these complex tasks where you've got to really analyze explicitly the phonemic composition of words and sort of work with the complexity of manipulating them. It's normally deeply contaminated by orthographic knowledge. It's mm, very difficult to assess the one without the other been confirmed. It was Linnea Airy who first pointed this out, um, finding it very easy to trick people, count the sounds in the word um, rich, and they would tend to count r itch, three sounds, now count the sounds in the word pitch, and people would be convinced there's an extra sound in pitch. Count the T in there because it's there in the spelling. Um, uh, Morag Stewart did a lovely little study. She was, oh, well, I'm um, using tasks that uh, fool the child. Well, so if I used one of her tasks in the spat out. You all know which one it's going to be. It's the item say cold without the all sound. Yeah. Yeah, right. <laughs> <laughs> and nine out of ten people say cold. cold. Cod. 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 Yeah. Nine out of ten people say cod. It's only the species who mm. think about it and say, oh. There isn't an oh phoning in no. cod. Mm. To arrive at cod, which has an oh in the middle, you only get there one way. Cross out the L and read what's left. Right? It's the visual strategy, and that is the normal visual strategy. Stuart found, and I've found it all the time, the spat R. It's the stronger people who do that. Giving the spat R, I find the weaker kids, probably who've been to some phonics lessons, will struggle with it and go cold, cold, the OL gives you a funny sound. And they'll come out with something like cold slowly and now get something that you would call correct but laboriously and of course the very weak kids have no idea what you're talking about. <laughs> <laughs> uh, Stuart found that the stronger kids can easily, fairly easily, if you explain that they've got to think about the sounds not the letters, they can understand why you didn't really want cod, you wanted something more like code. Of course, I don't count cod wrong in this spat hour because that would mean you penalise the stronger kids and you don't want to do that and to get, mm -hmm. give them a lower score. I'll come back to that. Tanma also um, did some very early research um, talking about in the um, phoneme counting task, which is very often used in research, you get lots of errors caused by attending to the letters instead of the sounds. So in ship you'll get answers of there are four sounds in ship. And in box you'll get a huge range of answers, but most commonly three sounds in there. Yeah. Right. Um, that's common and normal. And um, one of the troubles is, as Airy pointed out early in the piece, that visual strategy is really relevant to the complex manipulation tasks. We instinctively use it because 
analyzing the phonemes puts huge <coughs> demands on working memory. They're transient, they're fleeting. You say the sound and then it's gone. But if you visualize, there's something concrete that you can rely on to, um, uh, to manipulate. It's very normal to use that visual mm -hmm. strategy. But David Kilpatrick regards those cod, when you take the all out of cold responses, as an error. He counts them as wrong mm -hmm. uh, and says, uh, once you've counted that as wrong and reminded the child, just think of the sound, sounds, not the letters. He, you know, so he allows that you can do that. Um, he maintains that you really have to be able to do advanced phonemic awareness tasks in the auditory modality only. Mm -hmm. His evidence for that, and I want to ask him more about this, but his meta-analysis of the effect sizes yielded by training studies, his, he finds that you get greater effect sizes in training studies that force kids to do it in the auditory modality only rather than the visual modality. Mm -hmm. Um, I'm not sure. Some of his training studies were from studies using the Lindemood, and I'm aware that the Lindemood mm. does that to some extent, but goes on to quite extensive phonics teaching as well. So I'd like to quiz him a bit more on his meta-analysis. But that is what he found, and many systematic, systematic phonics researchers the Macquarie Uni people, most of the people on the DDAL network, disagree with his position. Mm -hmm. Their point is that all you need is basic segmenting and blending, very basic stuff, and after that, the ability to do the complex tasks will develop alongside good phonics teaching as an epiphenomenon of mm -hmm. good phonics teaching rather than as a prerequisite. Stephen Parker definitely disagrees. Stephen Parker disagrees with him. <laughs> Absolutely. He's been very vocal about yeah. this on the DDAL network. Mary, your inbox gets full. Yeah. Well, don't, don't go to Twitter. Yeah. yeah. So, let me just, now, given there's this problem, let me go back to where my thoughts are starting to go. I'm still in the starting to think this through bit about, you know, why is it that I don't understand phonological awareness anymore? If I were forced to say there's a difference between phonemic awareness and phonological awareness, one's not just a subset of the other, it would be that explicit phonemic awareness has the inescapable complication of interacting with orthographic knowledge explicit phonological awareness at the lower, easier levels where you don't have the grapheme-phoneme correspondence relationship coming in, doesn't have that complication, but phonemic awareness does. And that changes the ball game slightly. I'm edging towards a new definition of phonemic awareness I'll put down here and you, know, you, can, you can throw it back at me at some stage. Perhaps phonemic awareness, as we use it usefully is more accurate, accurately defined as the ability to focus on how phonemes and letters are mapped onto each other in systems of orthography. So phonemic awareness is seen as essentially a mapping issue, not just an auditory issue. And so the focus gets onto mapping. And when you've got orthography that isn't regular, as in English, where not every, there is not one-to-one -one correspondence between the phonemes and the graphemes, you need to be able to separate away from the graphemes and focus on the auditory and notice where the auditory and the visual are not tallying and learn from that absorb things like the whole morphine chunks that aren't strictly phoneme, phoneme mapping anymore, but a morphine mapping like the ED and the plural S ending. 
Now, um, so I'm talking about metaphonemic awareness, being able to think not only about phonemic awareness the way we normally do, which is to get mixed up with letters and sounds, but to think, no, I can't allow that to happen, I've got to distance myself from the letters. Just as little ones have to distance themselves from the meaning, we have to distance ourselves from the letters. Now, those of us who did Phonetics 101 were taught to do that, weren't we? And our teachers probably found it quite difficult with some of us, but by the end we would only pass if we could distance ourselves from the letters and understand why there's a just sound in soldier, for example. Um, but that might be what Kilpatrick is heading towards, that necessity of getting your mapping that goes beyond one-to-one -one simple grapheme phoneme mm -hmm. mapping, but getting something extra beyond there that involves leaving the phone, leaving the your learnt grapheme phoneme expectations behind, and really thinking about the phonemes and understanding how the mapping works in detail. <coughs> what are the implications of this? for me, trying to make a test with the Northern Territory Department of Education. In the fella, I've simply avoided the issue <laughs> by not including complex phoneme, phoneme manipulation tasks. My rationale for that was firstly, the other people on the um, Northern Territory Department of Education committee were adamant that it's very difficult to explain this to a child whose English is not very good. And I quite agree. I've made as much of the fellow as I can, as self-explanatory for the student as I can. So there are lots of visual cues. There's lots of, um, um, I've tried not to make it wordy, if, um, um, if you know what I mean. You, know, you can show what you mean rather than have to say, say what you mean. And I couldn't do that with phoneme manipulation. Um, and, um, you know, if you listen to Stephen Parker and the people who say it's not necessary, it's not clearly, self-evidently necessary as a target skill, and certainly not in the very early beginning years when you're trying to get the at-risk kids, trying to get them to square one. Um, it's not something that you need to keep in mind. So I took the easy way out. The fellow was already a bit too long. I didn't include any complex phony manipulation tasks. That's one feature of it. I do feel it's okay if you've got a student who's just about at ceiling on the fella, you'll still notice if they have literacy problems, you'll still notice the difficulties there in the non-word reading and spelling, especially in the non-word reading. So it's not that you're just letting the teacher think, okay, they're at full marks on it. There will be something for the teacher to notice on that. But the debate is far from resolved. So you see what I mean about it's got more complicated <laughs> as the years have gone by. Should we take a break now, come, come get yourself a glass of wine and um, just have a little breather and go straight back to your chair and we'll keep <laughs> buzzing right along, okay? Yeah. Okay, what I'd like to do now is just run you through what's the actual structure of the fella. As I go, I'll talk a bit more about what's in and what's not in there and it should make a bit more sense, hopefully, given my bit of theory to start off with. Um, <laughs> If I get time, I'll explain the complicated stuff on the front of the score sheet about um, grade expectations and things like that. That was my effort to um, keep things not expressed in terms of percentile norms, but to um, correlate with what the Australian curriculum's expectations are for what kids can do. So what the kids should be able to do at the different levels in the first three years of school, first four years of school, um, by the end of that they should be fully competent on the whole lot, at which stage I would feel the kid should be ready where you go now is good phonics teaching rather than 
having to worry about phonemic awareness. Given my possible caution about um, what I've been saying about phone advanced phonemic awareness, but the end of my story and that is that I think that should be built into good phonics programs, which I think some good phonics programs do. <laughs> Um, okay, I'm hoping that the fella at some stage will supersede the spat R, partly because I'm embarrassed about the spat R norms being so out of date. <laughs> uh, some people might find the spat R is still better for their needs, and so if that's fine, I'll keep getting it reprinted if necessary. Um, but um, the fella is meant to be able to span from the point of school entry, which the spatter doesn't really do, it's so just before you start school, uh, and you can stay on the same test, um, monitoring the kids through, through their first few years of schooling. So it's meant to be an improvement over using the C part and then changing to the spatter uh, or to another te test if that's what you do. Uh, it's presented on um, on a computer or a pad or or something, it's a lot more engaging for the kids than that stimulus sheet would have done. When people have all got their their tablets or whatever going anyway, you start off saying, um, "We've got a fair bit of work to do. We're going to do some clapping. We're going to say some sounds. We're going to listen to some sounds." Yeah, to do a little bit of writing, look at some letters, and at the end you're going to meet this funny fellow there and you'll find out what his name is. Mm -hmm. ah. <laughs> <laughs> and then we start off with syllables, which is my first entry into early phonological awareness, thinking let's see if kids can do both ex implicit and explicit work at the syllable level where you're not asking them to work at the phoneme level if they haven't mastered any phonemic awareness yet. We want to know how explicit they are with their metaphonological awareness. So you know how the spat are, you get them to tap on the syllables and almost everyone can do it. The only kids who really fail are the kids who are um, who are too smart and they say er, uh, bit, etc. <laughs> they can only do this because they already know you've got to break up words into sounds and so they fail for the wrong reason. <laughs> Some of the weak kids can do it just fine but it's simply just bouncing through. Um, helicopter, it's more a gross motor skill than, um, and a sensitivity to rhythm but it's not at all being explicit. I know I'm thinking about the syllables. So um, I ask for both syllable clapping. So here we have toothbrush and they have to clap out toothbrush. And then you, as in the C part, you, um, you animate an arrow that says, that points to the syllable they've got to say and you say, just say that one, don't say that. You can do it with gestures. Um, each of these things here uh, are recordings of me. Um, <laughs> the top one, I just say the word in case, for example, there's a kangaroo and the kid says wallaby. Uh, the administrator can say, yes, yes, you can say wallaby, but let's see what the lady wants us to say. So you can blame <laughs> 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 um, and in the second one, I show clapping, just in case you've got to model that again. If they can't clap it right, you keep modeling until they get it right. And then if they don't get the isolation task right, um, which means you're expecting them to say tooth rather than toothbrush, um, there's me saying tooth and showing silence there. Uh, the rule is if they don't get it right, you give them the correct answer because lots of kids mm -hmm. get it towards the end of the subtest. Mm -hmm. um, um, it's really fun to see kids um, learn to understand the task and learn how to, how to carry it out. Lots of kids, it's amazing how difficult the isolation task is. I think teachers find it very instructive. Uh, my kid can do syllables, we can clap kangaroo, 
But if you ask them just to give you that one, they'll say kangaroo. They don't know what you mean mm -hmm. by say mm -hmm. just that one. Mm -hmm. To say just that one, you've got to <coughs> think about the syllables, inhibit saying the first two, mm -hmm. and just say one. Mm -hmm. That extra level mm -hmm. of inhibiting part of the word is the metaphonological part of it. Um, it's very difficult for many kids at school entry and um, with the proviso that some <coughs> kids get mixed up as they do with a bit, they get mixed up, am I meant to do phonemes or syllables now? Um, it's not difficult to teach syllable isolation on its own. It's actually very difficult for speech sound disorders if kids have problems with polysyllabic words. It all gets much easier if you've taught them to do the isolation of syllables. Yes. So that's what's there mm -hmm. in the fella. I like the pics. <laughs> <laughs> and then you get to the end of the subject. <laughs> Next one. <laughs> okay. After that, I go on to first sound identification, and again with this one, um, if they get it wrong, I, um, uh, they get given the correct answer, and there's me saying what the word is. I say milk, and then and the one down there, I say milk starts with mm. Yep, good. No, that's okay. <laughs> good. I won't show you the pics of me doing We will avoid that. Now... If you look at the score sheets, you'll notice I've got two versions, uh, two scoring levels. You can score one out of two or two out of two for first sound ID. Mm. Mm. One out of two is for what I regard as the, the implicit level of phonemic awareness. Kids have cottoned on to the fact that you start saying the word and then you stop before you finish, but they don't really know you're talking about a phoneme there. Mm. So if they say bird, they'll start off bur. Mm. And they won't have, if they say ball and start off ball, or um, no, bat and start off bat, um, they haven't yet abstracted the phoneme. So mm. this is my early version of explicit, mm. of implicit versus mm. explicit phonemic awareness. It's good to know if the implicit stuff is coming because they're learning something about attending to phonemes, but they haven't yet got the explicit concept of a phoneme there, what it is that bird and ball have got in common. Okay. So we go on with that. Okay. This is the end of my early auditory phonemic awareness task. And you'll notice that we haven't had any rhyming mm. yet. Mm. <laughs> Why not? Well, for lots of reasons. I spent a lot of time in the fellow manual trying, trying, trying to support this decision. Had to persuade the Department of Education that I didn't want rhyming in there too. And I'm glad I don't have it there for several reasons. One is research. All the intervention research shows that you get better bang for your buck working at the phoneme level with school entry kids than you do working on rhyme. Yeah. That there's more a greater effect size, greater improvement in early literacy skills if you work on phonemes, not rhymes, not the onset rhyme level too. Yeah. Um, Another reason is that it's particularly unfair for kids from many different first languages, including the remote indigenous languages, where the language itself isn't structured the way English is. We have lots of um, single and two-syllable words with very heavy phonemes in the rhyme, so you can rhyme humpty and dumpty beautifully, or rich and pitch, you can rhyme really easily because there are lots of phonemes there, and they're short. In many indigenous languages, the words are polysyllabic, an incredible mm. number of syllables, mm. and uh, very few final consonants. So all the syllables will end in some sort of art-like vowel. 
um, the name of the language which teachers love doing anyway and who kids enjoy. The ones who can already rhyme will love it anyway. The ones who can't might learn to rhyme, but it doesn't matter if they don't, because my second point is it's so much easier to teach rhyming later on than it is early. It's really hard to teach a kid who can't rhyme to rhyme, unless you can have the support later on where the kid can already segment and blend at the CBC level, and they can attach the phonemes to graphemes and you can say these two yes. are we doing cap let's yes. sticky tape the A team together that's what we mean by a word family rhyming itself is very subject to implicit versus explicit um, skills the implicit rhyming skills are I think what you see in little ones who go around saying eggsy begsy and easy peasy. They're just sort of playing around with sounds, but they couldn't tell you why it's funny. They couldn't tell you about the rhyme. It's not conscious knowledge. Unlike you know, your understanding of rhyming, if I gave you the task of thinking of all the words you can that rhyme with bell in the next five seconds, Easy, isn't it? Mm -hmm. What do you do? How do you do that? <laughs> Sorry? I do E-L in my head, like E-L. You do E-L. Yeah. 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 Many, many people go through the alphabet. Yes, that's what I do. do. Yeah. Yeah. How metalinguistic is that? Yeah. Yeah. Could you expect a preschooler to do that? Yeah. Would you want a kid in year one to be able? because at this stage they're getting spelling lists that are in word families. And if they don't understand what Ben and Ken have got to do with each other, there's no point in giving them a word family. If they can do that, then they can generate their own. So I postpone my formal rhyming teaching until later and don't have it there in the fellow as, as an early skill to take. That's my reason. Get into lots of trouble from people who've just prepared view view rhyming programs. Okay, I go straight into, as I do in the CETA, a bit more complicated than the CETA. I want to know if at the same time as they're learning to do first sound identification, they're also learning something about the alphabet. It's very important for the two to develop in tandem. <coughs> I've seen, especially in the remote communities, lots of kids learning the alphabet completely without first sound identification skills. Mm. So the alphabet learning is entirely visual. It's just mm. a series of um, squiggles to learn without any connection mm. to the alphabet chart. Why um, the picture of a pig has a per in front of it is an absolute mystery. Mm. Um, they've got to be developing together for mm. the alphabet to be understood. And also it's good to pick up kids who've got their phonemic awareness going well, they can do the sounds but no one's taught them the alphabet or they have learning difficulties that make learning the alphabet difficult. I've seen that too, um, especially um, the kids who have had associate learning problems, and they often, often are picked up in the rapid naming tasks too. Mm -hmm. They'll, um, they might be quite good at telling you the first sound but can't remember what the letter is and what it looks like. You need to know, that's a target skill you need to know about at the same time as you need to know about first sound ID. So I put it in as a prerequisite skill. Kids have got to have both developing together. So as you'll see in the, um, in the score sheet, I ask them to give, I say, um, um, so do you know this letter? What sound does it make? And to just go through, it's not a full sample of letters, so just the sound. And they'll often say, that's my letter. Because <laughs> <Yeah. laughs> that's what my three, three year old granddaughter Caitlin says, that's my letter, but she doesn't know why. So at this stage, I've got to the point where I'm prepared to just about let the uh, school entry kids get their sticker and go home. I ask them to do name writing first. It's quite easy to give name writing a very simple 
school, you know, school, how many letters do they get, how's their letter formation looking, and do they know the names of the letters, not just they've been taught there's a circle and a stick, but they know that they do the letters. Um, so I remember my own grandson had learned some squiggles and he could recite J's. J A C K so Jack, but he couldn't tell me that was the J and the A and the C K. Okay, so you still just check that that's going there. So you score that. Um, if they can write their name okay, sort of you go on to the next probe, which is to see can they go even further. If they can't write their name, and you've got to show them how, you can give them the stick of them and tell them they did write it. So that's the class. Um, Actually, no, you first let them find out yeah, the name, the name. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah. and then they can go, go back to class. If you're going to, uh, if you have me there saying, comma, his name is Cobber. And I then say, Cobber would like you to write his name in the box below where you wrote your name. Could you have a go at writing Cobber? No, you don't know how to spell it, just have a go at writing it. I got this task from Maestro Morton Bedford Spelling Test. I don't know if any of you know that test. It's such a clear indication. Are they stuck at the first sound? Can they give you the first sound and try a letter for it? Or can they get beyond the onset of a word? If they can't get beyond the onset of a word, if they just give you something like a K, you can give them their sticker and tell them to go home. But if they can give you something like a K and a B, you know, you're ready to ask, can they segment and blend at the CBC level too? And this is where you're free to go on to basic segmentation and blending. Mm. I have done lots of research continuing on with kids who do just give me the K and I'm convinced at most they'll get score one or two more points, but you've prolonged the agony and they haven't ended on a nice successful note. So I really recommend that you dis discontinue it's necessary here. After they've, they've, they've said cover, I go on to non-word segmentation and blending. I introduce it by saying now cover, cover speaks a different language. He says funny words. Yeah, I like that. Yeah. Um, he knows what he means. We don't know what he means. I'll tell you some of Cobb's funny words. And so it's not just something crazy. There's, there's sort of some, something fun to go with it. And then I have a visual here of two boxes. And the demo is um, that audio thing has me pronouncing it. So it's not up to the test administrator no, yeah, to yeah, do yeah. it. Um, um, giving a, either two or three phony non-word and the kid has to point to the boxes as they segment it. And I've got quite complicated scoring rules. Um, I'm glad to be working with non-words there because actually it's more important with non-word blending that you get to let me just see where I can find here. Um, with the spat R, I find there's a huge um, discrepancy in the difficulty of the non-word blending items, mm. depending on the familiarity of the phonemes, the simplicity of the phonemes, and the familiarity of the words. So bake is by far the easiest mm. of the words to blend, but ache, mostly they'll get bake, and they'll find surf really quite difficult and farm fairly difficult too. At least with non-words there isn't the vocab issue coming into it um, and I've tried to give a range of phonemes mostly avoiding the very difficult indigenous phonemes like there's nothing with an initial H in, in the whole of that. I didn't mention, you'll notice there are a lot of things called phoneme approximations mm. in the scoring thing. This is the result of the Northern Territory linguists being adamant that I wasn't allowed to penalise Indigenous kids for interference in their uh, responses due to their first language. Mm. So if they come up with something that makes sense in their EALD phonological system that doesn't quite conform to English, phonology, 
Um, you give them credit for being aware of the segment there, being able to segment and blend it, but you circle it. It's something you've got to go back and mm. help them to get their categorization of the phoneme mm. right according to standard Australian English. And it's going to be very difficult with <coughs> voice voiceless mm. distinctions, for example. You expect those difficulties to be there and you notice them when they're there. You're pleased when they're not, mm. but you target them as something, this isn't phonemic awareness, this is categorization of the phoneme, it's an <coughs> ALD issue, not a phonemic mm -hmm. awareness issue, mm -hmm. which, which is a little bit, con little bit controversial to do, but I think it's useful. Mm -hmm. So we've done one word, CBC segmenting and blending, and we go on to non-word spelling, Again, I've got, I've got a recording of myself pronouncing the wrong word, so the administrators are misspelled. I can't never say it's Have you ever tried like to, to administer um, uh, the non words in the C top? Yes, oh, no. CD, please. CD. Um, and you score it the way you do in the spat are with a non-word spelling analysis where they get partial credit. It's not just all or none, but you see what phoneme skills are emerging and which they're still confused about. And in particular, you see if they're still marking the consonant clusters as just one phoneme or if they've got two phonemes in there. So that's the only spot where I get consonant yeah. clusters in, in the fella. But you do see it really well mm -hmm. uh, in their non word spelling. Yeah, yeah. yeah. flonk spells F O K. Yeah, yeah, yeah. 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 <laughs> <laughs> And then, and then, very similar to this better uh, non-word reading, I score the non-word reading on a four-point scale, like so, just about nothing there, almost there, there but laborious and slow, and there red flash. And as I skim through them, you'll notice that apart from the last two, which you've got to go a little slowly on, you can just read them. You don't need to sound out. See what I mean? That one you need another second. If you need a few few yeah. seconds for that one, yeah. but um, that's how the scoring <coughs> goes. So you give some reward for fluency. Mm -hmm. So that's the end of the fella. There you go. <laughs>